Hi everybody, very welcome to another live stream here on the Mentor Pilot channel. As always, I hope you're doing absolutely fantastic. So I am using a brand new software now. I'm using the uh, YouTube um, normal, this YouTube studio that they want us to be using. And I'm not sure if you guys can actually see or hear me. So if you can, please let me know, all right? Uh, I am getting messages here, so I'm guessing that someone at least can see me. Um, anyway, uh, just write yes if you can see me or hear me in the chat, and that way I know what we're working, and then we'll kick off with the actual live stream. How does that sound? Okay. So it seems like it might be up and running. Uh, cool. All right. So let's kick it off. The way that this works, guys, is um, I will be trying to answer as much questions as I possibly can. Um, I don't normally do these live streams during the week, but obviously I am still under lockdown. And for that, I might as well do some nice live streams with you guys. So <laughs> and now I can see that the, uh, the chat is going absolutely crazy here, which means that it's probably about a 10, 15 second delay from what I'm saying until you um, actually get to see it. So I will be trying to answer your questions from the normal chat, but the way that this normally works, guys, is that uh, there's so many questions that I won't be able to see them in time. So if you are really interested in getting your question answered, well then please use the super chat function. That's the little dollar sign thing that will support the channel with a bit of money. Uh, and it will highlight the, um, the question to me. So that way I will be answering it. And I always guarantee that I will be answering all Super Chat questions, which means that when we're starting to close in towards the end of this live stream, well, then I'll be telling you to not do any more Super Chat questions because I won't be able to, um, to finish them off. So that's where we are right now. And I would like to hear from you guys as well. How are you guys doing out there? Are you under lockdown? Um, and in that case, I hope you are doing okay, that you are staying safe and sane. Because believe me, um, I've been on lockdown for almost three weeks now and it's starting to take a little bit of a toll on me and the family. Um, we're in good spirits still, we're still very healthy and stuff, but you could start to think that you would like to see some kind of end, um, end to this <laughs> at some point. So, uh, so please let me know what you, how you guys feel as well. So I'll have a look here. We have a few Super Chat questions already. Um, Simone Faguto. When did you start your simulator examiner role and when are you finished? Or are you still a TRE? All right, so um, I started my examiner role in 2012, or was it 2013? I think so. Um, that's when I moved down here to Spain and I got my, my current job, which is a base TRE, okay? Um, in order to keep being a TRE, I need to renew my TRE license every two years. And uh, I've just renewed it now which means that if I would lose my TRE position now, if the base would close, for example, well then I would still be a TRE, but obviously not employed as one. So I would have to, to keep um, renewing that with the uh, Irish Aviation Authority, which is the authority that I'm working under. So yes, I would continue to be a TRE, but I'd need to be employed by an airline, obviously, in order to actually work as a TRE. I could be an external one as well, working for a simulator center, like for example, CAE, but generally speaking, TREs are employed by the airlines. So that's a great question. Uh, Jake, Ryan, why do you start a timer when setting takeoff thrust? That's a great uh, question. So we generally do that because we want to, in an easy way, um, calculate what our takeoff time was. So we know, we note down when we push back, that's when our block time starts, um, so off block, and then we taxi out. And if we set the timer when we start taking off, we put both the elapsed time and the chronograph on at the same time. The chronograph we put on in order to make sure that if we have an engine failure, that we don't run the engines on full take of trust for, a mac for more than five minutes, because that's what they're rated to. At five minutes, we have to pull it back to what we call max continuous trust in order to save um, the remaining engine if we would have an engine failure. But we also put elapsed time on. And that's why when we get up to cruising level and the pilot monitoring starts calculating on writing down all the figures on our flight plan, um, he'll be able to, to just count back. So, okay, so there was 35 minutes ago, the time is now 12.35, so we took off at 12 o'clock. 
And that's the reason for that. But that's a great question, actually. Um, Audio and video 5x5 from Marcus Lagen Langendorf. Well, thank you very much. Um, that's great to hear because, like I said, I this is the first time I'm using this particular um, setup and I'm still not, I'm still getting used to it. So I, I do apologize if I'm a little bit off my game today, but I'll do my best. I also want to try something. I, I know I promised you on my last uh, live stream that I would be, um, <laughs> that I would be, um, lost my thought no that I would be trying to find a new software in order to be able to go out and do for example a Skype interview um, I have found a software now but I've not gotten used to it yet so I can't go out and do collaborations on these live streams just yet but when I can you can be sure that I will start to reach out to my colleagues I hope that you went into plane savers and that you looked at the epic live stream we did there together with uh, Blanco Lirio together with flight shops and plane savers and me all four of us in one live stream at the same time that was truly truly epic as in I, I would love to do that on the channel as well and I'm going to I'm just gonna have to figure out how to do it technically before I uh, before I get myself into it okay so uh, Thomas Albert hi mentor what's your thought on the MH370 um, yeah generally I I try to avoid having opinions about ongoing investigations and MH370 is very much still ongoing now. It's starting to be so much time now and so little likelihood that they will actually find it that I can kind of start having some theories around it. Um, it's a very strange one. All right, I'll, I'll say that. Um, the trajectory of the flight, the fact that it went in between borders where, you know, there was a little bit of a question whose authority, whose ATC authority the aircraft was under, and that there was actually maneuvering being done, so it didn't just continue in one straight direction, but actually did some maneuvering, would indicate that um, someone was at the controls. Now, who that was um, still remains to be seen if it was some kind of, um, you know, interference from outside, if the pilots were involved, um, whatever. But the, the, the transponder was disappeared, the transponder was turned off for one reason or another, the aircraft continued to fly, and in a very, very strange kind of trajectory. So um, I would say that there's a high likelihood that someone was at the control. Now, who that was, very, very hard to say, and I don't really want to get into that either because I'm not fully read up on the case. But... Um, I really, really hope that we will get to the bottom of it, that they will find the wreckage or at least find, um, well, hopefully find the black boxes so we can get some kind of explanation to it because it's a real mystery. As in, it's, it's one of those real mysteries. And as a pilot, I don't really like mysteries, to be perfectly honest. Uh, Spirit19, thank you for all you do, sharing your expertise, inspiring future generations, passion for flight and dedication to safe uh, aviation. Well, thank you. I mean, I wouldn't be doing this if it weren't for you guys. The fact that I have you guys here and that you keep asking questions, that you watch my videos, that you share my videos and, and the, the general support that I'm getting from you guys, that's the reason why I keep doing this. Like, without you and without the feedback I'm getting from people who are sending me emails saying that, oh yeah, I'm in flight training now, it's so cool and just did my first... Uh, my first solo it's just like you said those are the kind of things that keep me going and when I go and do these meetups which I did uh, for example in Berlin just a few months ago and I did in Manchester about a year ago that fuels me as in I, I'm, I get to meet you guys I get to see who's on the other side of the camera and for me right now for example I'm sitting in front of an iMac and I'm watching my own face on the screen um, and it's very hard to see that that you know that you actually have almost 700 people watching this live stream as we speak. But when I do these these meetups and when I get the emails from you and the messages in the Mentor Aviation app, I understand that there are people who are actually benefiting from this, and that is a fantastic feeling. So thank you guys to what you are doing. All right. Um, I hope that what I do can maybe inspire someone to follow their dream, maybe help someone who is in a was in a rot who doesn't feel like they're motivated to do it because believe me I love what I do um, I haven't been flying for one and a half month now and it really that really sucks I have to say it really really sucks another thing that I want to take the opportunity to say now since I'm sitting here in front of you is a huge thank you to my patreon crew right um, 
you guys, you guys are my heroes right now, especially since this crisis is now starting to affect everything, including sponsors for us YouTubers. The fact that we have a hard, like a dedicated Patreon crew uh, that that supports us, even if if, if it's only three dollars per month it's still a huge contribution to the channel and i want to say a, a big thank you to all of you you guys know who you are you are my heroes right now it gives me some calm to create new material um i know that there's some income coming in that i can support my family on since you know I'm, i don't know how long this unpaid leave is going to go on um, so the fact that I can do that and not having to rely on doing sponsored content, for example, is extremely important to me. And I want to say thank you to all of you. Um, I'm, I keep increasing the um, the um, like the, the perks that you get when you're part of a Patreon. The latest thing we did was we opened up a Discord server for Patreons. And what I've done a couple of times already, which I really like, is to uh, to to set out a Zoom invitation to all of the patrons and then you can have a big zoom meeting with all of them there and everyone can, can ask their questions and I instead of me sitting like I'm doing now seeing your messages and seeing um, seeing myself on the screen I actually get to see the faces of the people who are supporting the channel and that's really really cool so thank you to all my patrons and having said that I want to continue with my super chat questions here and uh, Jonathan E hi mentor how are air traffic routes determined aircraft weight airline preference and uh, no aircraft routes are determined based on um, available route structure so all over Europe and the United States there are airways these airways can be either uh, one direction airways or they can be two direction airways generally though they tend to be one direction airways and they set in between different fixes along the route okay so for example if I'm going to fly from the UK and down to Spain it's going to be almost always the exact same route right or different altitudes um, so we can uh, assign different aircraft different altitude so you can you can fit a lot of aircraft on the same route structure but it means that air traffic control knows where the aircraft are going to they can plan for example if there's an intersection of two aircraft flying the same altitude and they have a crossing they know which route each aircraft is taking and they can tell each aircraft to maybe you know design them a speed to make sure that there is enough distance in between them it's hugely complicated but um once you have that route structure in in, in force it's actually very very effective so we can't just which is what airlines obviously want to do is just go straight where they're going where they want to go instead you see them flying a little bit of a zigzag pattern and then the um, air traffic controllers can give direct routings as we're flying but anyway the ones that are deciding this are the airlines they are filing a flight plan and once the flight plan has been approved it tends to then become what we call a repetitive flight plan which is that the airline uses the same flight plan for the same flight each and every day so they won't be sitting there and doing uh, flight planning as in route planning every day obviously the fuel planning is going to have to be done for each flight but but route planning is the same for each flight every day so for example now here in Girona where I'm based we do very few flights during the winter um, and that means that you almost know the route by heart after a while because you do the same route forth and back all the time um, but it, it works it works really really well but it's a great question thank you um, Altitudes, like you asked about weights, by the way, um, weight will have a little bit of an impact because, for example, um, our, like if we are fully, if we're really, really heavy, we won't be able to climb initially up to maybe more than 36,000 feet. While if we're really light, like we've been the last few weeks, then you're going to be able to fly at 41,000 feet. So the, air the airline is going to try to um, to file you at a flight level that is as close as possible to the optimum level for that aircraft weight on every given day. Great question. Student pilot Bertram, have you been share flying since lockdown? No, not yet. All right. Um, I don't really need to, to be honest. After flat, after twenty years, um, I think that like i'm going to be rusty when i get back actually i'm doing a video right now about um what happens if an air if a pilot sits on the ground for too long Um what i need is actually training in the simulator i need to get my hands on a, on a proper simulator because a lot of the training that that you do a lot of the things that you forget if you're not flying for a while is is kind of connected to your muscle memory so i want to sit in a simulator even if it's only like a paper tiger like a, a cockpit cardboard cockpit it actually helps a lot 
for your uh, muscle memory uh, and your brain to just sit and touch on the different buttons to remember a, 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 um, a um, scan flow, for example. So you'll notice that when you do your typewriting yourself, is that a lot of time you'll be sitting with your manuals and you'll just be sitting in a paper tiger pointing at buttons so that when you get into the simulator later on, you will remember. The same for me in the aircraft. If I would just get um, like an hour in the simulator and get to fly it around a little bit, I will be just as new, you know, back to flying just as normal. Um, but if I don't, then, you know, if I go more than a few months, I'm going to have to fly with a trainer. Even though I'm an examiner, I'm still going to have to fly with um, with another line trainer or even possibly a TRE in the right seat as a first officer to verify that I keep my uh, my skills up. Okay, that's a good question. Um, I might, I mean, my, like I would love to. Um, now this crisis is kind of, of course, creating a bit of a, of a money stop in the company. Uh, but before this crisis came, I was I was planning on buying a simulator or even maybe building one, but I'm not that technical. So maybe buying a fixed base simulator and put it up in a, in a place and have meetups there and do cool courses and do videos and stuff. I have a proper like 100,000 euro type simulator. Um, that's going to have to wait now, but um, but I'm, I'm still kind of playing with the idea. And if I had that, then I would be able to go there and just get another first officer and go and, and fly around a little bit because they work perfectly as training devices. What a cute result. Um, so to become a commercial pilot, if you're a uh, fighter pilot is, I wouldn't say easy, but it is it does help if you are a fighter pilot since before. You'll be able to use a lot of the hours that you've flown. You also understand things like route structure. You understand instrumentation all of that but you are still going to have to do some training to get your commercial licenses you're going to have to do the skill tests to get them and you're going to have to do the atpl theory the 14 exam so there is a little bit of training that you need to do now vice versa if you want to go as a commercial pilot to become a fighter pilot you'll go through the full training as if you've never flown before because it's a completely different way of thinking um, the military flying is something else so um like i wouldn't be able to go in and start flying a, a jaws gripping or something like that i would have to go through the entire flight train to become a, um, a fighter pilot and it's kind of the same when you're going the other way but yes you will get a, a lot of benefit from the fact that you have um, military time and also some airlines like the traditional all airlines like sas for example probably british or USA as, as well um, they would view it as extremely good that you have military experience because it shows that you you can handle well under stress, um, that you you know you have a certain type of character, um, the kind of old type pilot character that everyone thinks about. That's what they're looking for. So I know that the the guys that was in the Swedish Air Force, for example, they basically went straight into SAS during a long period. It's not like that right now, but but do for a long period, that's what happened. Okay. Um, do, 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 do. Oh, I, I should say before I continue, I want to say thank you to Grant Rennie uh, as well for your uh, little pies and uh, little emoji uh, uh, sausages that you gave me there in the beginning. Thank you very much. That's great. I'm always a little bit hungry. <laughs> so, um, where, when you will start descending into any busy airport? Well, Balai, um, Sharat Kumar, depends. Um, so the really busy airports out there, they will have very set um, arrival procedures called standard arrival route stars. Um, and you tend to, well, I mean, when it starts, comes to start with the descending, it's depending on what aircraft type you have and what flight level you're coming into. But coming into the airport is going to be um, done via this arrival route. And normally you have, for example, London Stansted, you have to be at certain altitudes at certain given points quite far out because you have several big airports and their route structures are all kind of intersecting with each other. So if I'm coming into Stansted, I need to be flat of a 290 by 15 before Laurel or something like that, I seem to remember. And that's just to make sure that I don't that I don't intersect or interfere with the rival routes into Heathrow. So um, there's a lot of those things coming on when you're coming into big, busy airspaces. Grand Rennie, thanks again. This time a peach. 
You can always go for peach. I just had dinner, so I need a bit of a dessert. Max Witt, doing fine in voluntary isolation. Great to hear, Max. Um, did my first live stream sim flight today. Stan uh, Gothenburg to... That's... That is ENGM. That is um, Oslo, is it? Stay safe and hang in there. Thank you. Uh, I will try to... Look, I get a lot of questions, by the way, guys, from people who want me to do simulator flights. Now, I that's not really what I do. I try to kind of stay keep to the, the type of videos that I know how to do, which is the explanatory ones, which explains what's going on out in the world or what's, how we deal with certain situations. I think that there are a lot of pilots out there, a lot of simulator pilots as well, that will be able to do live streams um, in simulators much better than I do, since I've literally never ever flown one myself. Uh, however, I mean, if this, if this continues for months, I'm going to have to find stuff to do. And if you guys want me then to see a a, a simulator flight well then i guess i'm gonna get myself a great simulator and fly it with you would be cool as well something that i would i did that a while back but i would like to try that again is when one of you guys hook up with me and i can be in on kind of a live link and help you guys how to fly uh 737 i could if you're a flight simmer out there I, I could sit and talk you through how you would have to do the setup because most of the time you guys are probably doing the setup following a manual something that you found on the internet but you don't you maybe you don't have the, the the exact knowledge of how this would be done in real life as in when would the dispatcher come in with your load sheet when you would you be able to finish up your cdo things like that and i i've done that which was really cool um but it was a long time ago and now with the wonders of technology i'm sure that we can do something similar again so that might be something that we could we could talk about. So um, Arnier, thank you very much. Empty ferry flight. Do add sandbags if wet conditions. No, um, rarely we need to add any sandbags, right? Because the uh, like when you have you have the normal operating envelope of the aircraft, and when you when you're empty and there's only two pilots on board you actually get a little bit of an extended envelope to work within because of the fact that you're so light. Okay, so it's very rare that you need to add any extra weight in there. Um, there could be under very, very specific circumstances or if you're kind of carrying, let's say that you're going empty but you're carrying freight for whatever reason, then you might need to add something in the front. Say you have carrying uh, freight in, in Aftold 3 or 4, then you might have to add some weight in the front in order to balance it out. But it's very, very rare that you ever have to do anything, um, especially not sandbags, um, to, to balance the aircraft out, even if you're empty. Alex B, Zoom got a couple of security problems. I would suggest not using it anymore, at least not until it's fixed. Okay, I had heard nothing of that, but there's all, I mean, I guess now there's so many people using Zoom that the, the hackers are going to be full on working on trying to, to hack it, so it wouldn't surprise me. But I, I have to say that I'm really impressed by the services that Zoom have, as in it's, it's really, really good. Um, Mika Gombic. Thank you so much for this channel and for all the work that you and your team do for us. Question, I'm 32 and I live in the United States. Is it too late to start flight school and have a successful career? And as always, um, when this question comes up, no, it is not, right? You can do whatever you want. You can do anything. The only thing that stops you is you and your own circumstances. So the older we get, the more we tend to be kind of locked down with family, uh, mortgage, how like these kind of things. And of course, becoming a pilot is a huge investment Right now, I would be a little bit careful. I like to monitor what's happening right now very, very carefully. Um, but 32 is is not is no age to start. Like that's not a problem at all. You'll be done at 34. You might have to work another two years um, in in you know becoming a flight instructor or something like that to build your hours up to 1500. So let's say you're 36, and at 36 you could start in the commuting the the local airlines um, that you have in the States, and then you'll be in the majors in another, I don't know, five, six years, depending on, on um, how much the need is. But like I said, and I've always said in this um, channel, it's very, very hard to, to, to kind of 
foresee what's going to happen. And just like six months ago, I was doing these live streams and I said, well, if nothing major happens, it looks like great. You know, this, this is, it's going to be a little bit of a plateau now, but then we're going to need a lot of pilots from 2021 and onwards. Well, this thing is throwing everything over the head. No one was expecting to have a huge global pandemic um, affecting the airline business in the way that it does. So right now, we're just going to have to kind of sit back and watch a little bit. I do think that if we get this sorted and get the you know, industry running again uh, within a few months, well, then we will see maybe a 15% decrease from what we were expecting, 10, 15 disp- at towards the end of the year as in the normal December traffic might be negatively infected, um, inflicted like that. And then we will see it starting to pick up, but it's going to take a while now to get back up to where we were, which is going to slow things down for everyone that is wanting to get into the business. So right now it's a very, very precarious kind of um, situation and we all have to be very careful when, uh, when, when it comes to taking decisions, especially large financial decisions. Um, Red Dragon, pan 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 pan. What's happening, dude? Let us know how we can help you. A pan pan is an urgency call, so I guess it's not that important. It must be something that is kind of maybe you will need to run to the toilet or something. I don't know. But please let us know what the pan pan call is about. Or do you want me to discuss pan pan? And in that case, there's the difference between a pan pan call and a mayday call. So pan pan is a so called urgency call. It means that the aircraft wants priority uh, for something but it is not a, uh, um, an emergency. An emergency is uh, defined as where there is a, uh, a potential, loss, potential loss of life, a potential uh, injury to the aircraft or someone on board the aircraft. So an urgency, as in a pan pan call, uh, does not reach up to that standard. But at any point, you can upgrade a pan pan to a mayday. If something was okay, like you might have someone who does not who's not feeling well, but it's not life threatening. If that's now turning to actually this person has a heart attack, well then it's a mayday and so on. Um, cool. Thai gay tiga tiga. That's Swedish. How do you think airframe and power plant mechanics will be impacted by all of this? Working on my PPL now and starting AMP school in May. Um, yeah, I mean, the whole industry is going to be impacted and how bad that's going to be is all depending on if airlines are going to start going bankrupt. Because if airlines start going bankrupt, then there will be a surplus of both mechanics, engineers and pilots and the cabin crew out there. And that's going to have an effect on both the you know possibility to get a job, but also the salaries and things going forward. That's the supply and demand, basically. Um, if the airlines survive, and I think most will, then there is going to be a, a small slump in the need for a while until we get the passengers back up um, traveling again. But once the, pa- the traveling patterns have returned to normal and the passengers have gotten you know, their kind of confidence back, well then we can expect it to start gaining speed again. And we still have the baby booming generation um, going into retirement. 21, 22, 23. Uh, that means that there is there is like a pent up need for pilots, and that's going to go for engineers as well. And engineers and mechanics, there's actually been um, a need for for quite long, as far as I've understood. So I I think that in a f- in a few years, especially if you could start in training now, you should be able to get a job at the end of it. But once again, it all depends on how bad this actually gets. Okay. Morbidity, obese, or morbidly obese. Uh, would you recommend working part-time whilst doing your PPL for funding? And if so, how would you balance it out? Thank you. Oh, thanks a lot. Uh, yeah, if you go in the modular route, the one of the few reasons that you would go the modular route is to try to be able to work at the same time. So um, in that case, you know, you're going to have to sit down with your flight school. You're going to have to kind of come up with a... Um, a, a training plan as in you know how quickly do you want this done how much money will you have to spare in order to go to flight training and then uh, plan your flight training around your job that's the that like one of the really really good things we're doing a modular route um you can do it fast or slow if you want the only thing is once you if you go up towards the commercial pilot license cpl then once you've done your um, um your exams i think you have an 18 month 
correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think you have 18 months from when you finish your exam until you have to have picked up your CPL, right? So there, there is a time limit involved there once you start doing your um, your exams. But apart from that, you can let it take as long as you like, especially the PPL can take a year or two if you want to, but I wouldn't recommend it. It's better to kind of get the training done and get yourself up and flying as much as possible when you have the chance. So um, let's see. Do, 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 do. Hi Mentor, can I be successful as a commercial pilot starting my license in the mid 30s? Is it quite rare for commercial pilots to start at late age? From Leo Mendes. No, and given the amount of questions I get on this, I'm, I'm, I'm starting to think that it's quite common actually. And also, I'm in my mid 30s. I don't feel old. I don't feel that I'm, you know, that if I, if I want to change a career now, if I want to become a boat captain I think I can if I want to drive trains I think I can if I want to become an engineer well then maybe I'm you know depends because I need to go back to school and and do some serious training and I don't I'm not sure that I would be able to afford that because I have a wife two kids a house a mortgage two dogs all of these kind of things but that's exactly what I was talking about before that it's it's depending on what your situation is if you have the money and you have a very understanding wife or maybe you don't have a wife maybe you don't have kids go for it you know you only live once very rarely regret things that you have done it tends to be the things that you haven't done that you end up regretting so if pilot is what you want to try to do make sure that you understand what you're getting yourself into the whole journey talk to me talk to other commercial pilots talk to flight schools find a good flight school and get kicking you know sky's not the limit as they say so, uh, uh, um, Grant Rennie, have a great night, everybody. You too, Grant. Great to have you here. Stuart Bailey, hi, Mentor. I have a voucher for a 90 minute 77 sim session. What scenarios should I ask to do? Do a landing failure, train escape? Well, no, I wouldn't. Like, those scenarios are things that not even trained 737 pilots would enjoy to do. Um, if you want to get the most out of your 90 minutes, uh, if you are a sim enthusiast, a flight enthusiast, I would ask to do as you know as realistic things as possible. For example, I would definitely ask to to do a few circuits, like ask them to, to do um, some touch and go landings with the 737, so that you get to feel you know the the takeoff level off, trim the aircraft, get it under control, get the checklist done. Your instructor is going to do that with you. Uh, they can show you how to look when you're beamed the runway, how much timing you need on the outbound leg, turn inbound, start descending, get, getting the gear and the flaps out, establish yourself on final, get that under control, land, take off again. Like do that a few, a few circuits because that's really going to give you a feeling for the aircraft. And then, by all means, an engine failure off the takeoff can be something that they can show you how to do, just to feel how the difference in, in power is. But like dual engine failures, it, effectively, it's just everything turns off. Uh, you need to get the AP on, and then you just have to land somewhere. Um, it's scary, even for us, to do those kind of things. Terrain escape and over? Yeah, that could be interesting. You could fly out of Salzburg, for example. Um, to see all of the like the mountains around you and see what kind of um, what kind of uh, scenery you get and what kind of warnings you get, but I wouldn't do something extreme because that's uh, that that will be you know when when the kids play with flight simulators the first thing they do is to take off and they try to do a looping and a roll and stuff and then they get tired of it and that's because to kind of do those things and then like eh it's not real and and that's it. It's so much more satisfying to do things that real pilots are actually doing and see if you can do that. So ask if you could do a manual ILS, for example, something like that. That's what I would do if I were you and enjoy it. Okay. Get, <laughs> go and get the, uh, um, if you want to see how, how to do it, if you go, if you get the Mentor Aviation app and you go to one of the collections, you'll be able to see, for example, a TCAS maneuver. That's something that you can do, like traffic collision and avoidance um, manu maneuver. Um, or a wind shear. You could try a wind shear. Wind shear escape maneuver. That's also something I have in the app. So go and check that out first and then, you know, use what I teach you in those collections uh, and impress the instructor. 
So, uh, to do this for dogs, what are the names? Um, yeah, the names of the, my dogs are Molly and Patchy. Patchy is the brown one who's always with me on every video. He's never leaving my side, basically. When I wake up, I have him here with his nose there. And when I sit down in the sofa, he's sitting here or here. And on my videos, I've actually managed to convince him that he shouldn't be sitting on top of me. So he's actually sitting you know, just next to me on the sofa. But Patchy is always there. Molly is a little bit more um, kind of... She doesn't like to be on video much. Uh, she says a little bit to herself. She's very cuddly with me. She's a little bit less cuddly with the kids. Uh, but they're both toy poodles. They're extremely smart. Okay, So they, they, learn, they learn things crazy quick, which is really, really fun. Okay. Um... Markaryd, no, Mark, do that, Mark, Markidarki, <laughs> Markidarki. There we go. Uh, three, four. Hi. I know this is a pointless question, but I just wanted to know out of curiosity: How often are the outside of planes cleaned? Is it just when they get dirty? Um, that's a great question, and I don't have a good answer to that, unfortunately. Um, we do clean them when they go in for major maintenance checks. I know they do that. And uh, out of like out of sequence cleaning can be done if they're extremely um, dirty because obviously if, if they become too dirty that actually has a negative aerodynamical impact so they will use more fuel which is not a good thing but um, the exact need for cleaning I think mm, it's a great question I don't know exactly maybe there's someone here in the chat who knows that better than I do uh, Chris Wall, hi. You said the other day that you would love to fly the Concorde. Did you know you can fly a supersonic fighter? Could you not get a sponsorship? Maybe. Um, I have actually been, <laughs> I've been in contact with a, with a friend of mine um, who, who suggested me that I should go and fly a MiG-29, um, which apparently he's, he has a friend who owns. Um, the only thing, <laughs> the only thing I have with that is that um, I am the sole provider of my family. And I really, really, really do not want to crash um, with some privately owned MiG-29 somewhere. Um, so I am a little bit risk averse. That's one of the good things of being a commercial pilot. Like by nature, we are risk averse. We will try to avoid risks. And if you see something obviously risky, as in flying a fighter, um, generally speaking, then even though I would be really intrigued, I like I would love to do it. Um, I, I still am a little bit like that. Right? But it would be, it would be insanely cool. Now that I think about it, I don't think that I'll be able to convince my wife though. But Concord, yeah, I would. Um, White World Wes, great to have you here, Wes. Hi, Peter. Would you recommend getting a simulator during this time we can't fly, or is it not worth the cost? Thank you. Um, um, well, I mean, no, uh, I mean, you, if you're flying for an airline, then they will provide you with simulator time in order to get you back. If you feel that you are in your training stage, um, then maybe, maybe it could be a good idea to do it, um, in order to keep yourself up and running. But no, I like, I would personally not pay for simulator time unless it was because I needed to extend my rating and I didn't get it or something like that. But, uh, but that's just me. That's just me. Um, like you're talking to someone who's actually thinking about buying his own simulator. So <laughs> I'm probably not the right person to ask. Uh, cool. Um, Juan Daniel Garcia P. Um, so I see that your super chat question came, to, uh, super chat came through, but not your question. Um, I, I guess that you had a question. And in that case, just go into the Mentor Aviation app. Okay. Go to submit feedback and just write super chat question in the tagline. Um, that way I will know that it's from you and just ask your question there and I'll answer it to you via mail instead. Um, thank you for supporting the channel. Jake Schroeder, what is your favorite airline library? I have always loved British Airways library. I think that it is good looking without being kind of um, too much. I think that it looks classic. Uh, I, yeah, I just like it. So that library together with the call sign Speedbird does it for me. That's that's very nice. The combination is very, very nice. And if that on top was to be applied to a Concorde called Speedbird with that library, that would be even cooler. So uh, Concorde, sorry, uh, British Airways is my favorite when it comes to libraries. But then, of course, you have these special libraries that comes out, the Star Wars libraries, um, 
these kind of things. I mean, I, I don't really count them because they're obviously really, really cool, but they're not really a company library. Um, but yeah, there you have it. So Søren, who, uh, what do you do if you reach VR but not V2? Uh, I don't know why, in what circumstance that would happen. Because if you've reached VR, you passed with one, you would have your engine running, at least one engine running. And the way that we calculate our performance is that you will always have that. You will always be able to accelerate to V2 if with this weight you have an engine failure and you continue past VR. So the only time that that would happen would be if you have a dual engine failure. And if you have a dual engine failure, then, you know, God help you. Then you just have to land straight ahead if you have a long runway uh, and hope that you can stop or, well, you don't have a choice. You don't have any engine. So you're going to be landing straight away, straight ahead, no matter what you do. So I don't really know. I mean, you could, I could see, of course, you could VR and then you could over-rotate it so that you, you lose speed that way. I don't know why you would do that. Um, you could potentially stall the aircraft if that's the case. V2 is the climb speed that you should be keeping. So, um, yeah, that's just me free balling a little bit here. I don't know if I answered your question correctly. Uh, Devo, thank you very much uh, for your uh, support. If you had a question, just do what I tell, told, um, um, told Juan before. Just go to the app and get me a message there. Javier Leon, um, I mentor, hope you're well. Are you confident your airline would manage to ride the COVID storm or do you envisage redundancies or failures ahead? Um, as always, I don't talk about my airline or what I think about my airline. Um, I am confident that they will pull through okay um when it comes to redundancies you never know that depends less on the fact that the airline will pull through more on what happens to passenger demand because if it turns out that let's say for example let's play with the, the thought that um the airlines would be able to start flying okay but during this downtime people have started to question whether or not they should be traveling Let's say that's the case. So people say, well, actually, I've been home now for three months. Turns out I didn't need to go to Milan to shop. I could go to Stockholm instead, which is just three kilometers down the road. Um, and also, I'm a little bit careful with my money now. You never know if this comes back for a second turn or whatever. So I'm going to be saving and I'm going to be sitting at home and stuff. This is the, this is the danger of a situation like this, that the, the customers will not come back. All right, And if that's the case... Then obviously, even if the airlines start flying again, if there are no passengers flying on the route, they're going to have to scale down. And with that comes redundancies, right? So you cannot completely take away that possibility. Now, there are other possibilities as well. And the more likely is that initially it will be, um, it will be rough. Initially, people will not be traveling and then the airlines will do whatever they can to remind people that actually it's kind of awesome to fly and to go somewhere with huge sales, you know, that's going to be really cheap to fly to get people back flying. And then after a few months, people have forgotten about what that reason they didn't fly was and then they will be back up on top again. Now, what's going to happen then is that the airlines that had bad economy that couldn't survive the cash flow loss that this is, they would partially disappear, could go completely into bankruptcy. And what happens then is that the airlines who had good economy, they will be able to come and take market share. So they will come in and they will pick up the pieces where these other airlines used to be, take up their passengers and expand. And in that case, what could happen is that what you'll see is that some airlines will actually go beneficial. Seen over a three year period, for example, they might be able to grow much quicker than they would have if this didn't happen. In that case, those airlines will be recruiting a lot okay so that is a huge possibility um but it all depends i mean if this thing comes back in the autumn in september and another close down comes all bets are off then you know then we might go back to what it was in the 70s where the all the the this the airlines were owned by the states they were nationalized you know, because airlines will always be needed. Remember that they're a hugely important part of the infrastructure. We need to be able to get spare parts from China to our machines in the factories. We need to be able to, to transport people between the countries. All of that is, is essential for the infrastructure of the world. So airlines will be there. But if they're owned privately or by the state who has bailed them out, 
that's a different question and that remains to be seen okay i i don't like the fact that i'm sitting here talking to you about these things about the possibility of even that happening just shows you how quickly things can happen in this industry um so yeah well in any case i will try to be there and try to explain what's going on for you um providing i get to to continue doing this i love doing this youtube channel i love that you are here that you're asking these questions and i get to talk directly to you so once again if you want to support what i'm doing if you want to, me to continue to doing this um then please consider to go in <laughs> to patreon i see that's here you see this is the address to patreon so um so patreon.com slash mentor pilot and and support the work that is really really appreciated okay um ryan delilio or delolio ryan delolio yeah delolio thank you what are the your favorite videos to make uh, do you prefer topical news videos basic instructional videos or advanced concept videos what content would you make if you had more time love this genre all right so i have a few favorite things to do i love explaining the things that i do so for example the the video that i did yesterday about uh, how to fly an empty aircraft i love doing that because it, it's stuff that i know the stuff that i have done that i can explain the stuff that i do on a regular basis when i'm a line training captain as well and i explain to people like listen now you're gonna have to think about this so it falls naturally to me now um, the videos that I think is most fun to do are the ones where I actually get a hold of a simulator and I can explain, for example, crosswind or hydraulic failures or electrical failures. But I don't like sitting and explaining the failure from a technical point of view as much as I like showing it. So if we do complete loss of hydraulics, for example, manual reversion, I want to show how much power you actually need in order to fly the aircraft and where the problems are. And I want to be able to explain to you while I'm flying. So I love doing those things. But also, equally, doing news videos um, is challenging from a different perspective because what I do then is I see what happens and then I apply my experience and the little knowledge I have about it and I think about how to present it to you. Uh, now, the issue there is that I might be wrong. You know, I might be saying something that turns out to be completely incorrect. And of course, if it has to do with news, it's a little bit more risky. This is the reason why I've stopped talking about the 737 MAX, for example, because I realized that, hmm, even though um, it looks like I've been fairly right so far, um, if I would do something, say something wrong here, uh, or if I would decrease the, the confidence in the type or whatever it might be, I am going to be sitting as a captain on that thing. I'm going to be flying it around. How I can't marry that with the fact that I'm talking about it as, you know, like a news person because I'm not a journalist. I am a pilot. So I have to be a little bit careful about what I'm talking about in the news cycle. Um, and I hope that you understand that. So, um, Jonas Kvarneby. Tjena. Hoppas allt är toppen. Great regards from Stockholm. Out of curiosity, what was the first plane for you to fly as a captain? And what were your thoughts as a new captain? Thanks for awesome YouTube clips. Well, I started off on the 737-800. So that was my first ever commercial aircraft to fly, which is also the aircraft that I became a captain on. Now, I became a captain... Um, Fair, like it took me a while become, to become a captain because I chose to become a simulator instructor before and that slowed down the hours and you need a certain amount of hours, 3,000 in our case, in order to, to be eligible to go for command upgrade, which means that I, I was first officer for almost five years where I could have probably have upgraded three years if I tried to. Um, that gave me a lot of confidence and being a flight instructor and a simulator instructor gave me a lot of confidence as well. So the, the, the command training was still hard the theoretical and stuff was not that hard because obviously I've been teaching that. But when you get out in line training, um, that part of that taking control, I got a lot for free from my simulator instructor days, but it also took a while to get my head around the fact that I was now the one that's, that was responsible for everything. And I think it's the same for anyone who goes for, uh, for command upgrade. Um, the feeling, like, to become a captain is great you feel a lot of responsibility in the beginning and you also think that everything is happening to you in the beginning. Um, 
you think that that's what everyone is saying. If you ask anyone about their first week as a captain, they will say like, "Oh, there was everything happened to me. I had bird strikes, I had sick passengers, I have failures on the aircraft, I had to call maintenance, I was stuck somewhere, I had to go around, I had to do a diversion." And and the funny thing is that normally when you look back at it, even though it feels like this is happening all to you because you've just become a captain, what you realize after a little while is that that's just a normal week. It's just that now you are the responsible one. Now you have to take all the decisions. You have to know what to do. The first officer is looking at you. You are not looking at the captain. So all of a sudden, you since you are the one that has to take all this, all of a sudden you realize that, oh shit, actually, I think I actually had a bird strike as the first officer as well, but it didn't really matter that much because the captain knew what to do, you know. And we did a diversion as well, but once again, the captain knew it. But when it's you who have to do those things, when the cabin crew is asking you what to do with the sick passenger, when you are the one who have to figure out which airport that you need to divert to, it's a completely different thing. And this is why people think that their first week as a commander is like horrible. And then the second week's like, it's still a bit biffy, but but it was much better. Third week's like, actually now it's starting to slow down a little bit. It's starting to be like normal. That's because now you've taken this decision a couple of times. You know what it feels like to take these decisions. And it... Not, I wouldn't say it becomes second nature, but you definitely get better at it as you get more and more experience. And um, yeah, that's that's exactly like my uh, my first week as a captain as well. So Balai Sharat Kumar, Boeing seven two seven pilot got upgraded to fly Boeing seven four seven or seven triple seven. What do you do? If I had the chance to do that, um, like I've said, I think that you have to rephrase it a little bit because everyone thinks that you become upgraded to fly a bigger aircraft, but you know, if you think about it, if you drive a drive an like a, an Audi, and you get to drive a a lorry afterwards, it's bigger, but it's not an upgrade. All right. The fact that something is bigger doesn't need mean that it is necessarily an upgrade. In fact, a lot of pilots might have chosen to stay on a smaller aircraft in order to forward their um, life quality. I am one of those pilots. I should also say that I have never flown long haul and I would have loved to try that. I have a lot of pil- a lot of friends who have gone from 737s and gone up to fly the 777s um, to fly long haul and then they've gone back to the 737s because they've realized that, you know, over time I prefer staying with my family rather than sitting in a hotel somewhere. But at least they have tried it so they can talk about it. I haven't tried it, which means I shouldn't really be be saying anything about it but the only reason i haven't tried i haven't the only other airline i've ever applied to was british airways um that was back when i was really new first officer i didn't get it didn't get in um and um when they called me back for another interview a year later then i had already gotten another job as in the flight instructor the sim instructor job that i was talking about before and i didn't i didn't come back again that if I would have gone and I would have gotten into British Airways, it's likely that I would probably have gone in through long long haul and then up into, um, sorry, short haul and then up to long haul because the pay structure is different and you, you, you get more paid. And, you know, that is an upgrade as such. However, the reason that you get more paid is because you've gone more. And these kind of things, generally as a pilot, what you get paid the most for is when you sell off your private life. All right. So if you if if you have a, a bad roster, as in a, a roster where you work a lot of nights, for example, or you're gone a lot from your family, you stay a lot out or away, you you're generally paid more, right? And that's if you think about it, quite logical. Like they're they're paying for your time, but then again, time is the only thing that you can buy. Time is the only thing that you that that you'll never have too much of. So you have to ask yourself after a while. How do you want to spend your time? Like, do you do you appreciate being out traveling a lot? A lot of people do. There are people who maybe they don't even have family at home. And in that case, that's great. You know, you'll spend a week in Milan, another week in Santiago de Compostela, and then you're back in Anchorage um, flying a cargo plane or whatever. And that could be the best lifestyle in the world for you. And in that case, great, you get high pay and you get to do what you want. But if you don't want to do that, if you want to be home to see the football games of your 10-year-old boy, uh, you want to make sure that you're home for Christmas, or you want to you know, be at the weekends to have barbecues with your neighbors or whatever, if that's important to you, well, then maybe the extra money that you get is not worth it, right? So these are the kind of things that you have to think about when you get into the role, when you take a new job. 
when you're applying for that new job, the least thing that you should be, should be thinking about is which aircraft type that you will be flying, right? Because it doesn't matter. It's just as far from the cockpit to the nose on a 737 as it is on a 747. Like that's what you see. The cockpit sits a little bit higher up. It's the same thing. You fly it the same way. You just sit for there for a little bit longer. So these are the kind of things that you think is going to be really important for you. And it's really, really, really cool for the first four months. And then it's the same. So flying an aircraft is extremely cool. The job is extremely cool. Air, long haul has its clear benefits. Short haul has its clear benefits. You have to choose what's important to you and what's going to make you happy. You still have a cool job, okay? <laughs> Excellent. So, uh, Fate Struggler. Hi, Mentor. Love your videos. Wanted to be a pilot back in the 80s. Got diabetes, dream out of the window, uh, but have used my PC for flight sim. Yeah, I'm, I'm really sorry to hear that. Uh, I have a lot of diabetes in my family as well. Uh, my uh, cousins on both sides have diabetes. Um, so I know that it's a risk factor, you know. It's, um, it's, it's, it's a pain. Now, fortunately, in some countries, they have started allowing um, people with type 1 diabetes to fly if they had a, a, a class 1. So if you had a class 1 and you've been working for a while as a, as a, uh, as a pilot and then you get diabetes all of a sudden, it is possible to continue to work providing that you follow these really stringent rules for how you measure your, your blood sugar levels and what you eat and stuff. But it is possible to retain your job. It, you're, you're not automatically disqualified, but it's still, um, it's still a disqualifying factor for your initial class one, unfortunately. So I'm really sorry to hear that. But I'm happy that you continue to fly with, during, um, well, with the PC and that you yeah, kind of keep the passion alive because it's important. Um, so Ethan D. Smith, uh, what is your all-time favorite airport to fly in to and out of? Also, what is your favorite training scenario in the sim? Keep up these live chats, we all enjoy them, thank you for your time. Well, I've been doing more of these live chats now, like I'm not doing anything it's, uh, except sitting in the house and doing videos and thinking about videos and thinking about the Airline Pilot Club and how to help you guys, so you can expect more of these live streams, definitely. Um, so. Airport to fly into. So I love flying to my hometown. There's not like I'm I'm really nostalgic as a person. I when I go home to where I grew up back in Örnsköldsvik in Bilsjö, I always get a tear in my eye. I actually bought a house over there just so that I could go back there and have somewhere to stay um, when I'm off. Um, so flying to my hometown to Örnsköldsvik or anywhere in close to that, Umeå, Skellefteå, Sundsvall. It's just the best. Like you, I, I love the feeling to do that. Now, when it comes to coolest ones, there are different. There are, um, well, I like flying into Rome. That's always beautiful. I love flying to Malta, especially when I'm training. I keep saying that on my live streams, but uh, Malta has great air traffic control, great runway, great approach aids. There's no obstacles that you have to be worried about. It's, and it's beautiful. It's really beautiful, often very good weather as well. So flying to Malta, I really like, um, and out of there as well. But then you have things like going into Gatwick is always cool. There's so much traffic. You have to be really on the ball with air traffic control and stuff, which is cool. Like You see, if you loved your job, it's not like you have clear favorites. Everything is a little bit cool. Everything has something positive with it. And that's what's so cool with this job, because it's not like you're going in stamping your, your you know, putting your um, suit off on the same chair every day and you sit down and you do the same thing. To a certain extent it is because the procedures are all the same, but no single day is exactly like the other. There's always going to be something that's different, something to look forward to, something that will challenge you a little bit. And this is something that you not you won't get in all other uh, occupations. So it is very cool. Um, and that's why I like it. To, to, to training scenario on the sim. All right, so... Um, um, this is a little bit hard, all right, because there are two things that I like doing. Well, there's a lot of things that I like doing in the sim. I don't really particularly like checking people, okay? I am a TRE, so that might sound a little bit weird. But checking people is just me sitting passively back, observing what people do, and passing judgment. As in saying, this, this was right, this was wrong, this is safe, this is unsafe, this is a pass, this is a fail, all right? That 
is something that is important to do, really important even. You can still, there's still a bit of an art form to, to kind of handle the sim in a way that the guys feel is realistic. You'll get the most out of them if, you get, if they feel that it's realistic. But it's not really the, the most fun thing to do. The most fun thing to do is to have a set of cadets and do training. So do, for example, engine failure off the takeoff with cadets. Because they're like white pieces of paper that you can write on. You, they, they tend to be really well trained, they tend to be really motivated, they tend to be really good. So when you get them in the sim, uh, you tell them to do something, they do something else. You stop the sim, and this is also something that's different from line training. You can put freeze, it just gets quiet, everything stops. And then you'd look at them and it's like, okay, you see, you see now how the slip and skid indicator looks like that. You see how you're losing the runway, how you're kind of turning away and you're starting to bang. Now, if you put a little bit more rudder in just before you rotate, you'll be able to keep the descent line better. You'll be able to get yourself on that center line and just concentrate on rotate. And it's going to be much, much easier to get, to have the correct amount of rudder in. You can just continue on the center line and go off. And then you put them back. They do the same thing again and they do it right. And you can see, you can look at them when they're doing it. Because as an instructor, you, you don't only look at what happens to the aircraft. You have to look at what happens to the student as well. Uh, so you're kind of sitting with one hand on the on the sim screen. And you, you, you're manipulating what you want to do. Like when the engine failure coming as well. You put that in. You see how what's happening to the aircraft. And you look at what the student is doing. And then you can see, okay, so not only what happened, but why did it happen? And how are they going to fix it? And when they fix it... And you look at them and you can see that smile coming on their face like, yeah, I got it, yeah. That is the best feeling of being a sim instructor. Like that is why you are an instructor because you want to feel that. And you will get out and you know that these guys are 100% better now than when they enter the sim. They will go home, their brains is going to process what you've told them. And when you get back tomorrow, they're going to do much less mistakes and they're going to be much better. And your job as an instructor is going to be much easier. So that's what I like doing, you know, when I'm in the sim. Um, also, what's kind of fun is to to see train crews doing uh, loft scenarios. Loft scenario is line oriented flight scenarios. Okay, so they you we have made up a scenario about something that should be realistic, not multiple failures, but something that causes something else. Um, a crew takes off; they have no idea what's going to happen. They take off. You put in a scenario. Could be, for example, a a broken pitot tube or a broken um, pitot heat that can happen you know that's just a tiny little fault you get master caution and the eyes you look up and you see that okay the the um, pitot heating system doesn't work take up the manual to check through and it says like okay so if you fly through icing conditions you might get erroneous um, flight indications or speed indications and then the next thing that happens obviously is that you plug that uh, pitot tube so you simulate ice basically and then they get unreliable airspeed and with unreliable airspeed comes that they need to do memory items and with the memory items it comes that they need to fly they need to communicate with the air traffic control they need to to take up checklists they need to do it correctly and this tiny little failure which is just that the heating doesn't work leads into a much more com uh, complicated failure which then you'll see different leadership styles you'll see different crm some people solve it in one way and other people solve it in another way they all do the same memory items, but the thinking and the situational awareness is different. So I learn. Now I sit there back and like, oh yeah, that's that's actually that's a brilliant way of doing that. Cool. I'm gonna I'm gonna remember that for, for my own <laughs> check. You know, uh, that's cool. That's very very cool. So I learn. I still learn. And I remember when I did that as a first officer when I was um, when I was an SFI, like the, the amount of p things that you learn from experienced captains was immense. It's huge. It's one of the main reasons I, I think people should do the SFI thing is that you learn so much from how other people are doing things, both how to do things right and how to do things wrong. And you can learn from both of those things. Okay. Oh, right. Um, that's it. So, Matteo Sande, it's great to have a roster pattern that permits you to be back at home every night, but I really miss having a few layovers. Matteo, first of all, I thought about you today. Actually, I was looking through my Patreon list and I saw a message that I got from you about a year ago when you moved over. Uh, and I was thinking about you, thinking, I wonder how he's doing. I wonder how, how everything is, is shaping out. Yeah. Um, yeah, I understand. Like, I would actually like to have a few layers as well. Not many, you know, but a few months would be cool just to kind of break the, the, the pattern a little bit. 
so I, I see I see what you mean and I guess you I haven't really had the pleasure of doing it so I, I don't know what I missed kind of but I know that you who's been flying in I think it was Brazil before um, you're probably very used to doing these kind of things so um, I can I can imagine and I wouldn't mind getting a few just a few you know two a month that would be it. just to to kind of get the feeling of it I agree and I really, really hope, uh, Matthias, that, that everything is good with you and the family and that everything has sorted itself out. I, you know, I really hope so. Send me a message. You, you know how to reach me. So, um, Sovik, Chakrabortri, what was the most dangerous failure you've handled, you have handled during a flight? Oui. Uh, engine, an engine overheat. That's probably the, the worst one because it, it comes with you almost shutting the engine down. It, you can end up shutting the engine down if, it, if the overheat warning doesn't go out because an overheat warning is just a temperature difference from an um, engine fire, right? So there's, there's two loops inside of each engine that feels the temperature. And when the temperature reaches a predetermined point, it thinks a engine overheat. If you have an overheat, you do memory items, which is auto throttle disconnect trust lever retard so you don't close it you retard it that means that you're pulling it back until the, uh, the the indication disappears so if you pull it back and it disappears it means that the temperature is now below limits and you can actually continue to use a little bit of thrust on that engine so that's the difference but if that doesn't happen like if you pull it back and then the, the, the uh, overheat warning is still there you might have to shut the engine down because if that temperature increases one step more up to another, the next predetermined limit, then you'll get the fire bell coming up, and then you have an engine fire. At least that's how the uh, it's interpreted. So that's probably the worst I've had. Now I think that was a fault indication, but we did the memory items. The only thing you can do is do the memory items, and uh, and we went down and we landed accordingly. So uh, otherwise, I've had some flap issues as well. We had to land with flap 15 because of. Um, um, skewed flaps, um, things like that. But the the NG is extremely reliable, like very few bigger technical issues with it. So, uh, Ian Jill, hi Ian, great to have you here. Uh, Peter, how is Sandra coping with you being home? My wife has a secret list of jobs that I can't, <laughs> that I can't find. <laughs> Sandra is doing well. I mean, Sandra is one of those women that 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 really appreciates her own time and to be alone a little bit. And of course, it doesn't really work. She loves having her sofa and living room and me being at work and the kids being at school. She's the one that works with the company. She's the one that takes care of, of you guys, the patrons. Whenever I want to send out something to you, she's doing that. She's also taking care of all of the um, the paperwork that comes with running a company. Um, the you know all the things that comes in with the applications that I run with the YouTube channel with the Instagram with with all of that so she takes care of that but that means that she's at home a lot and when I'm gone and the kids are gone she has house quiet for herself and she loves having that at least for a few hours so I think that out of the whole family she is probably the one that is suffering the most from this because she doesn't get any own time at any point there can be kids running in uh, or I can be coming out asking about something or whatever it might be so you know but she's doing well I, the whole family is doing surprisingly well actually it's just a feeling that the feeling of grayness you know when 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 you've been home for a while I feel it when I start to see that it might be problems with the economy of Spain you know when you can see that the supply chains are starting to have problems to like Yesterday I heard about the meat industry having a problem because the workers are not there, so the, the like the meat is not being produced, which means that the meat is now not coming to the stores. And the, the, when you see that there's starting to be a little bit less food in the stores, people are going to start, you know, panic buying that, and you're going to end up with nothing. Um, and those kind of things, like in in my generation, we've never really had a problem with produce, with food on the shelves, but this can lead to that. When you have these kind of things happening, people not working, it can lead to a real like shortage of stuff, in, which we've never seen in the Western world during my generation and almost not in the previous generation either. My grandparents saw that during the war, but that that's kind of it, you know. Um, so that leads a little bit to a kind of feeling of sadness. But no, we're healthy, 
with Weld. I have the channel to work on. I can work on stuff for you. Uh, I have a lot to do, do with the Airline Pilot Club still. Um, so we're doing well. Thank you. Uh, 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 Thomas Albert, is there an age cutoff in Europe for new pilots? No. Some schools have it. I have been in contact with a school who said that they don't take past, um, new students over 35. But that's just their own their own rule. Um, generally speaking, I haven't heard of any age cut anyway. Mm -mm -mm. Um, and Kramer86, thank you very much. Dave O, thank you as well. Is a, vis uh, is a visual check of your co-pilot's inputs always necessary, even if you if you have been flying with them for years? Example, you call for flap 15. Yes. So, like, I don't look at my co-pilots when they're flying. I don't see how they're handling and stuff. I see what the aircraft is doing. And if I see the aircraft is doing something that it shouldn't be doing, then I check on what they're doing, right? But when it comes to asking for flaps, um, asking for configuration changes, for mode changes, for heading changes, altitude changes, it always have to be verified. It does not matter how experienced the pilot is, they can always make a mistake, so you always have to follow the standard operating procedures. Um, this is one of the like really, really basic fundamental principles of flying an aircraft in a multi-pilot configuration, is that you always verify. And it doesn't matter if you've done it 10 times that day. No, you do it the same time. You, you look at it, that's the same as when, when I do something myself. I choose, I verify what button I want to press. I press it, I verify that I get the response from the FMA, the flight mode denunciator, and I call it out. You never call it out as you press because sometimes you press and the button doesn't work and you don't get it. If you called it, the other one might not check it properly and then you, you find yourself in a situation you don't want to. A good example is, for example, engaging the autopilot. So after the departure, when you engage the autopilot, you need to have the aircraft completely trimmed out before you engage it. If, you, if you're not, if you have a little bit of input on the yoke and you try pressing the autopilot button, it will not engage. Okay, so in fact, in order to engage it, you need to trim it. And then as you're about to press the button, you need to let go of the controls and press the button. That way you know that there's no input on it, all right? And it will engage. But what tends to happen is that sometimes people get sloppy with this. So they're like, ah, come on, Dave. Or come on, be engaged. And then they start looking out the window and they don't realize that actually, come on, be did not engage, right? You don't have an autopilot and the aircraft starts to like you know and you realize that like oh shit back in but this is a perfect example of why it is so important that at any given point not only does the pilot mon pilot flying need to check press check call the pilot monitoring also have to verify that what he or she is calling is actually what you have all right very important uh, uh, uh. Okay, um, guys, I, I don't know how long I've been doing this now. Okay, so that's coming up to a good hour and 15. So I'm probably going to have to, uh, to slow this down now a little bit. Uh, I can take a few more questions, but that's it. Um, so, uh, Mika Charamkovic, hi again. What scenario as a pilot makes you the most uncomfortable? What scenario as a pilot makes you the most uncomfortable? What uh, that you experience fairly regularly? Okay, um, winter operations, all right, um, that's it. Winter operations, thunderstorms, as in frequent thunderstorms, um, is, is probably it. But winter operations, by far, is what poses the most threats at the same time. And the, le the less you work in it, the more uncomfortable it becomes. Because it has a lot, like you have performance penalties, you have handling penalties, ice buildups on the aircraft that can lead to handling issues you have slippery taxiways as you're taxiing um, things freezing things being ingested into engines these kind of things so wind drops definitely one of them uh, frequent thunderstorms is nasty because it can happen and it can happen you don't know where it's going to pop up you have a prob 40 tempo there's going to be thunderstorms at your destination and that your alternate and all of your alternate because it tends to be in one area 
everything at once. And then you don't know if you're going to come there and it's going to be a thunderstorm sitting on top of your airport and your alternate. Or if they're both moved and both of them are clear. So you need to take a lot of fuel for that. And I mean, after a while you get used to how you're going to handle that. But it's still not kind of nasty. And then you have to decide, you know, when can you start an approach? How close to the thunderstorm do you want to do it in order to get the aircraft down, you know, with the appropriate amount of fuel by not being too close to the thunderstorm either. Um, this puts a lot of that, that's when it's nice to be a captain because I can say hey no you're going to do another hauling and that's it right I'm not a first officer that sits with a captain or said actually I think we you know I know it's still there but you know as we've finished the approach it's probably going to have moved away and you sit there as a first officer and it's like will it are you sure you know that that situation is tough as a captain not so tough I sit there Look at it. Nah, we take another hold. That's another five minutes. Who cares? You know, we, at least it's going to be cleared off, and not only is it going to be gone, but also the water from the runway has cleared off and everything. And you know, that's five minutes. We were already late. That's it. Uh, 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 Natalie Olson, Natalie, great to have you here. Uh, when training a new pilot, how much time do you spend teaching uh, how to talk to ATC? Almost nothing, because when they get to me. They should have gone through their whole CPL, like their PPL stage, their CPL stage, their instrument stage, their multi-engine stage. Um, they would have done their MCC training in simulators. So generally speaking, they're quite good at air traffic control that, at that point. However, it should be said that most of them have never really felt the pressure of a high density traffic area. And in that case, I would come with some pointers also, like how to remember longer frequencies, you know, how to set up part of it on the on the um, uh, radio control panel um, or audio control panel, I should say, before you hand over, things like that. And if I see that there is an issue, then we have internal guidance documents that's like, listen, probably need to read through this manual a little bit just to make sure that you're, you know, know what calls need to be made when. Um, but generally speaking, we don't spend too much on that. In the beginning, when you're doing your PPL and maybe even your CPL stage, then it's going to be a lot of emphasis on getting the uh, traffic control communication well. But when you get up to the airlines, it should more or less be there. Matthias Hande, thank you. Well, thank you. It's great to have you here. And Kevin Cribs, thank you as well for your support. Well, guys, uh, I am, as always, running out of uh, voice. I have my coffee, which I, as always, haven't had time to drink. Uh, I'm going to take some questions now as well from the, um, from the normal chat. I know I keep forgetting you guys. Um, so, Phil Lee, I think you guys are answering each other's cap, uh, questions here, which is great. What is the best way to get over the fear of flying from Devon Estes? Um, so, fear of flying is a little bit depending on what the reason behind your fear of flying is and when it appeared. So you should ask yourself, when did you start becoming afraid of flying? So if you've always been afraid of flying, then there's something underlying, something that that might be um, worth talking to a um, to a psychiatrist about. Um, and also, if you feel that you have like a you know, like a blind, like uh, that you're so fear, afraid of flying that you cannot even think about flying, that you get panic attacks when you come close to an air aircraft, then you need professional help, all right? Because the, it's a lot of processes that you're going to need to go through. A lot of people get afraid of flying when something major happened in their life. So I've come across a lot of people that have said that, listen, I was never afraid of flying, but then I had a child, and then after that, I started thinking what if something happens to me, and I started to get more and more afraid of flying. In that case, it's something that happens to you where, like, the human brain is still a primate brain. It's still, we're still monkeys, you know, and we cannot, it's sometimes very hard for us to, to concentrate on what's actually bothering us. So the, the, the brain, take something that it makes sense to them to be to, to the brain to be afraid of which is flying okay it makes sense to the brain that we shouldn't be flying at 800 kilometers per hour at 10 kilometers up makes perfect sense if something happens in your life it can be a divorce it can be um, yeah like I said childbirth breaking up um, moving getting a new job or whatever and you do a flight in connection with this the brain has a tendency to take that and focus 
like, okay, I am actually feeling really bad right now. It must be because I'm flying. And then they project it onto the flying. And in that case, um, some normal, just to get like what you're doing now, asking questions, watching YouTube channels about learning how to, what this is the flying is all around, but also thinking back at it and actually realizing that mm, maybe it has something to do with that can help. Now, what I'm going to do, um, I know I've been talking about this for years, but what I am planning on doing and actually working on now is a course, of, a, 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 you know, a, a nervous fly course. I'm not going to call it a course for people who are afraid of flying because people who are really afraid of flying, they need professionals to do that. But I'm going to go together with a personal coach that I know uh, and I'm going to create a, a program for nervous flyers that is going to give you some useful tips on how to prepare at home how to prepare when you go through, you know, into the terminal, through security, when you're sitting waiting for the flight, when you go through the finger into the aircraft, tell you about what the pilots are doing, give you the knowledge that you need to know in a very non-technical way, as in explaining it bit by bit. So, and I'm going to be putting that up on mentorpilot.com. I don't know how long this is going to take me, but I will do it because I think that there is a real market need for, for products, a product like that, which is actually good. Right, which is for someone who can actually look you in the eye and tell you, because it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how much I tell you that flying is safe. That's not the problem. Like the problem is the way that your brain is is, is dealing with information, and that can only be changed by increasing your knowledge grade, and to a certain extent also work with with some relaxing exercises and stuff. But uh, but keep right now, keep following the YouTube channels that you like. Captain Joe is great, you know, I hope that I can help you with some videos as well. Um, look at uh, what plane savers, look at flight shops, look at For Fun Flyer, look at these, these YouTube channels and, and just start to gather a little bit of information about what's going on, a little bit of enthusiasm and then you can even maybe go out to a flight club and ask to do a private lesson, to do an actual flying lesson in a small Cessna. It's going to feel terrifying. But once you've done that, then you will realize that sitting in, a, in, an air, in an airliner is going to be nothing for you. And also give me feedback. If there's something that you want me to explain or whatever, let me know and I'll try to do it. Um, Carlos Lopez, Mentor Pilot, will you get a YouTube membership? Um... Are you mean the actual membership levels where people can can pay to be like have different perks and stuff on YouTube? Um, no, I don't think so. I don't really like the way that it works here now is that any income that comes through the YouTube channel um, that Google takes thirty percent of that, um, and that's the same with the uh, with the membership levels. So if I would create membership levels and give out perks and stuff as what YouTube requires, then whatever you give um, as a member would be taken, 30% of that is taken by Google. Right, that's the way it is. I don't really think that that's fair because I think that most of you guys, especially you guys now who's doing super chats and stuff, you probably do that to, to support the work that I am doing on the channel uh, and maybe not so much what Google is doing <laughs> to enable me to do that. Uh, so that's why I have concentrating on doing that on Patreon, all right? Because Patreon has been built to support creators, not only YouTubers, but people who are artists, who are singers, dancers, everything is on Patreon, right? And they take 5%, um, which I think is a much more fair um, kind of level to take if you want to make money on what other people do. So no, I am at the moment, I think I'm going to stick to giving any, any perks to Patreons and yeah, that'll, that'll be it for now, unless something like significantly changes. Um, cool. So Momotonic123, this might be pretty random, but is there something that you've historically witnessed as a pilot that was emotional for you? A retirement, an important flight, uh, flew with family members? Yeah. Yeah, and I, know. it was it was a huge feeling when I took my mom and dad when I was a pilot for for them, like that was that was big. Um, I can't I can't even explain the feeling of you know because you 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 realize that especially as a dad myself how it would feel 
if I was sitting myself in an aircraft and Lucas or William was the captain of that aircraft, it's something you can't even get your head around when you've been taking care of them, when you've been nurturing them as kids and you realize that they could do something that, you know, that they take responsibility for your life in such a literal way. So that was, that's been huge. Um, and I've had the pleasure of doing that on a few times, actually. Um, what else? I've seen people retire, which is also hugely emotional when you realize that a, a long um, career has ended, that they won't be flying anymore. And you can see it on them when that happens. It's, it's a big thing. Um, apart from that, well, nothing that, that springs to mind immediately. It's a great question, though. Good question. Uh, so, last super chat question comes from Kevin Cribbs. What's going to happen to the Book of Pilot program? It's gone. I'm very sad to say. Um, so what happened was that I came up with the Book of Pilot program. I thought that it would be a great idea to, to take some of these pilots that are now sitting on the ground, not doing anything, um, put them into a program where they could earn some money. Basically, I would you know, set up a program where you could, if you wanted to pay 35 euros, and I think it was when I released it, it was like 16 euros, um, for 45 minutes to an hour, to talk to a pilot, about whatever you wanted. It could be just like right now, but, you know, mano a mano, as in one-on-one -on -one talk. It's about maybe, you know, how they became a pilot, or they could teach you, if you're a flight simmer, how to do a proper setup of the Airbus 320 or something like that. And I thought, there's a win-win situation here. Um, my idea was that, that if the pilot was employed, then me, my company, would take 25% of the income. If the pilot was unemployed or on furlough, they would get the whole amount. Right, that was the idea, so that there would be a you know a, a, a kind of altruistic um, side to it. And I started it, and we did about five or six sessions. Uh, but then I started hearing that people were taking offense by it. So there was there was uh, I didn't get it myself. They didn't they didn't send any hate to me. But some of the pilots that I had doing it was getting a lot of hate mail messages from colleagues and stuff. And I still cannot wrap my head around why. Like, I do not understand why someone would have a problem with people, A, supplementing their income when, they're lose, when they've lost their job, and B, charging for their time. As in, it's not like they were charging for just giving random advice. They were being booked up on a specific time. They had to be there, they had to prepare, because people who booked would send in, like, I would like to know this, and they would have to prepare for that. So it was an actual job. Like, it was 45 minutes of working, but in a nice way. But people were still taking offense, and these people were getting abused. And uh, and I had a Twitter altercation with a, uh, a, a fellow pilot who thought that I was... What was the word she was using? That it was um, that it was profiteering, yeah. And for me, for my life, I cannot understand how you could see someone creating a new income stream and giving that money straight to the person who's doing it. How that could be profiteering? But obviously, it was enough for people to be pissed off. Now, I should say that it is a, it's a very special time right now in the industry and a lot of people are afraid a lot of people are angry and they don't know where to kind of focus their frustration and anger and it's if they find something for it and I, i'm just I that's the only explanation i can have that that's what people were thinking but uh, um that's what happened anyway and i felt that if people around if my colleagues or some of my colleagues or even one of my colleagues think that i'm profiteering it's not worth it um so i stopped it it's as easy as that now, it might come back in a different format. Um, it might come back as a free service um, where people have the, the opportunity to tip the pilot, for example, as in you don't pay anything to book it, you can do it. And then afterwards, if you feel that you've got something out of it, you can tip the pilot. It might come back to something like that um, or in a completely different format. I don't know, because I still think that it's great to, to kind of get pilots to talk to you if you want to do it. And it's up to anyone, you know, it's, free will on both sides but I this this is what you, you never know what you're gonna come up against uh, and I have to I have to be careful to not you know to not hurt people um, 
because I reach I reach a lot of you guys. I mean, there's 700 of you watching this right now. And there's going to be even more people who have watched this tomorrow. So that's the thing. Uh, right, so last couple of questions here. Um, Balai says, do more live streams, thanks. Absolutely fantastic. Well, I will. I will be doing another one on Sunday, so I hope to see you all there. Hi, Peter. Hope you're well. Thanks for the live chat. Well, thank you, Todd. That's great to hear from you as well. And Mr. Smiley C is the last one. Do you know if you've had cases of pancreatitis and still could pass through medical class? Uh, pancreatitis? Uh, pancreatitis? No, I don't know. But like... I never go in and discuss medical issues here because I'm not a aeromedical examiner. It would be very wrong for me to go in and, and talk about things, especially when it comes to like if you can get your medical or not, when I don't have the knowledge. So the only thing I can say is that if you go in and you Google AME and your city, you will have a list of um, aeromedical examiners in your city. All cities have them. They're normal doctors who have the license to be uh, an aeromedical examiner. They have email addresses and telephone numbers. Just go get the email address, send them an email, say like, listen, I am thinking about going for class one for a pilot. I, I want to have you as a doctor potentially, and I have this issue. Is this an, a showstopper for me? And they will be able to tell you, and then you have gotten it straight from the source. You've gotten it from someone who can actually talk about it. So that goes for any one of you out there who wants to have medical advice. Do not ask a pilot about it. They will not know. And someone who tells you that they know might not know the most recent. It might be when they got their medical class one, which was 15 years ago, the rules might have changed. The only way that you will know that is by going to an aeromedical center, which tends to be one in each country, or a medical examiner, which will then either tell you what it is or defer you to the aeromedical center. All right? Really important that you do that, guys. So last one here, Jason Toy, love your channel, best, best wishes from New Zealand. And on that bombshell, guys, I want to say thank you for all of you who've been here watching. Have a lovely evening wherever you are. Stay self, sorry, stay safe, stay healthy. And uh, yeah, I'll see you probably tomorrow when I'll release another video for you. So bye bye. And by the way, get into the Mentor Aviation app after this. Say hello. I usually kind of chill out there for a while, even though I think my wife is calling me already. So I, I might not have time for that. But go over to the Mentor Aviation um, app anyway. It's free to download, guys. You all should have it by now, <laughs> right? You get all of the news over there. You, they're, you know, they're pushed out to you when there's something major, and there's always major news nowadays. And uh, it's just a really cool place to hang out in the chat or in the forums, ask for technical details, talk to other aviation enthusiasts, all of that. So. See you in there. Bye-bye.